Hi everyone, this is our first online lecture, week number one, Factors for Test Selection and Considerations for Test Administration. Content will include some test terminology to ensure we're all on the same page. We're going over evaluation of test quality, some factors of test selection, and then considerations for when we're administering tests. Start by defining some testing terminology. The first being the pretest or the baseline test. This test is before the beginning of training to determine the athlete's individual baseline ability level. Okay, it allows for the program to be designed with the initial training level and overall training objectives in mind. That's called the pretest or the baseline. Then there's the mid test or what I consider the spot checks. And these are tests that are administered once or more during a training period to assess progress and modify the program as needed to maximize the benefits. And this is called the measure of the effectiveness of a program. So this mid-test or the spot check assesses the effectiveness of the program. Next type of test is called the formative evaluation. And this is a more formal testing period where you're doing a reevaluation of the training plan based on regular mid-tests. So you're doing many mid-tests, many spot checks, and then this ultimately is called a formative evaluation. So you may have assessed your athlete four or five times within their training plan, and together those four or five spot checks make up a formative evaluation. And the purpose of the formative evaluation is really to improve the training plan. The last test is called the post-test, and this is the test that's administered at the end of the training plan to determine the success of the training plan in achieving the training objectives. It is important for you to understand the differences between a pretest, mid-test, formative evaluation, and a post-test, and I want you to start using this language when we talk about testing. Let's now move into the evaluation of test quality. So it's really important that we pick the right test that evaluates the physical ability we want to test and we want to evaluate. So there's two key factors in evaluating test quality. First of all, it's validity. Does the test measure what it's supposed to measure? And second of all is the, is the reliability. Is the measurement repeatable? Can we repeat this measurement? So now let's explore the first factor of evaluating for test quality, and that's validity. Now let's consider test validity. Firstly, it's the most important factor of a test. Second of all, it is, by definition, the degree to which the test measures what it's supposed to measure. And thirdly, there's various types of validity. There's construct, face, content, criterium referenced. I want you to be aware of the various types of validity without knowing each in detail. So now let's look at some examples of validity. First of all, Sue picks a max bench press to assess back strength. Well, we know that a max bench press utilizes the pec muscles, so it's not a good indication of back strength. So for Sue, this would, her uh, picking a max bench press would not be a valid indication of the individual's back strength. That would provide poor validity. Second of all, Rob selects the BEEP test or the Leger test to assess aerobic capacity in runners. Well, first of all, the BEEP test is a test designed to assess aerobic capacity. That is true. And it is a running based test. So this test selection would be a valid test. It does measure what it's supposed to measure, aerobic capacity, and it's also designed for that mode, which is running for these athletes. The third example is Rob selects the BEEP or Leger test to assess aerobic capacity in cyclists. Well, yes, the BEEP test does assess aerobic capacity, but in cyclists, it's not the best mode of testing. Cyclists usually cycle. So a bike-based test would be more applicable and more valid, more accurate to assess aerobic capacity in cyclists. For the last example, a bike-based aerobic assessment would be more accurate or more valid to assess aerobic capacity in cyclists. The next factor of test quality we're going to look at is test reliability, which is the measure of the degree of consistency or repeatability of a test. Can we repeat the test and expect similar results? So what's been shown in stats is if there's a statistical correlation, a relationship of the scores from two administered tests, then that provides a measure of the test retest reliability. 
So for example, if we were to test an athlete with the beep test on day one, and then the same athlete comes in and does the same test on day two, we would expect similar results. Any difference between the two tests would be a result of measurement error. And some sources of measurement error are intra-subject variability. So that's within myself, the variability from day to day. So that's called bio-variation or bio-variability. An example of intra-subject variability would be if on day one I was being tested and I ate breakfast before I was tested. On day two I was tested, but I didn't eat breakfast before. That would be a form of intra-subject variability. There's also inter-rater variability. So that's between you and me. So I test differently than you for the same test. That would be a form of measurement error source of measurement error is intra-rater variability. An example of this is if on day one I encourage the testee. So I say go, 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 push, 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 and they're able to push a little harder. Then on day two I don't provide any verbal encouragement. This would be a form of intra-rater within myself of variability that I'm not being consistent with the way that I'm providing verbal encouragement, which would affect the results also a source of measurement error being the failure of the test to provide consistent results. So the test itself is inherently flawed and there's inconsistency within the test to provide consistent results. That would be a source of measurement error. So that's why it's so important to pick tests that have been evidence-based tests that are valid and reliable tests. And lastly, the source of measurement error can also be in the administration of the test, how we administer it what time of day, and what environment, and many other factors which we're going to explore. Now let's look at some examples of reliability. Let's look at the first one. Bev and Lucy are asked to conduct the same exercise test protocol, but they do it differently from each other. But they also expect the same result for their participants. This would be a form of inter-rater variability, where they're being inconsistent in the way that they deliver the test. Another example is weather. How does the weather impact reliability of outdoor testing? Well, if on one day it's not raining, and on day two of testing, the same testing with a different group, it's raining outside. This would be a form of uh, a confound that would affect the reliability of the testing. You could not compare the two test results because one was done when it was in a dry conditions, and one was done when it was wet and slippery and rainy. So you want to ensure that if this was the case, if weather was poor, you would postpone the testing to ensure that the environmental conditions are the same when testing is being done. That's very important. But the third example is John tells athlete one the time they have left in the test, but for athlete two, he doesn't tell them. That's a form of intra-rater variability that he's varying, he's not being consistent in the way that he is providing verbal encouragement and providing verbal instruction. Okay, so you want to ensure that you are always consistent because that's a form of measurement error which will affect the results of the test. The next example is a great example of re good reliability. So Tristan ensures that all testers are properly trained with the exact testing protocol and hires the same trained testers for the next round of testing two months from now. That's fantastic, okay? That's, called, that's trying to be consistent with the way that you deliver the test as well as minimizing the inter-rater variability. As well, research has shown that a test-specific warm-up increases the reliability and validity of the test. So that's why making sure that you're consistent with a warm-up before a test is very important and making sure it's the same warm-up each time, the same time, the same exercises to ensure you're going to get a consistent and valid measure of the individual's ability level when they do the actual test. Now let's look at a case scenario and this is a real case scenario that happened to me when I was being tested while I played on the Canadian national hockey team. So Johnny asked Laura and Ben to be in charge of the pull-up station for two groups of swim athletes. Laura tests one group and Ben tests another group. Laura doesn't allow the athletes to use their legs in helping with chin-ups and Ben does allow the athletes to use their legs. 
Ben's group of swimmers does on average four pull-ups more than Laura's group. What is happening in this scenario? Well, first off, we see a discrepancy between how Laura and Ben are administering a test. One allows the athletes to use their legs for pull-ups, while the other group doesn't allow, isn't allowed to use their legs. And as we know, anyone who's done a pull-up, if you use your legs to get momentum, you can do more because you're using it becomes a whole body exercise rather than isolating the core and the lats. So in this case, it's an inter tester or inter-rater reliability issue leading to low reliability for the testing. And it really causes anxiety among athletes because some athletes will say, what, you were able to do 12 pull-ups? Well, I was only able to do four. But the people who are, who are doing less are actually doing them more accurately and doing them better and doing them as what uh, the test is supposed to measure, which is an indication of core and back strength. So in this particular example, we see no standardization of the test protocol. We see a lack of tester quality and training that John should have explained the test standards before putting Laura and Ben in charge of the test stations. And this has led to large measurement error and inconsistent uh, testing results if you were to retest them. So in six months down the line, if these athletes were tested again, they may be able to use their legs, while prior they weren't allowed to use their legs. So it would um, artificially fabricate their results. Unfortunately, this happens all the time. This happened with me at Hockey Canada. One time we were able to use our legs, the next time we weren't, and our results dropped and we got in big trouble by the coaching staff because they thought we decreased in our upper body strength, so we were put on a greater training program. But really, it came to inconsistency in how the test was administered. So it's very important. It seems intuitive, and you probably are thinking, well, yeah, I, of course I would be consistent. But this happens all the time. It's either on a minor scale or on a major obvious scale like this. But please be aware when you're administering a test to have uh, validity and consistency in the way that you approach testing. So here's an illustration to help you understand the difference between validity and reliability that we look at the um, archer stand up on the left hand corner. We see that if someone misses the mark, misses the bullseye, but is consistent in the placement of the arrow, that's a sign of reliability, that it's consistent, that the person shoots consistently, and that has good reliability, but it's not valid, it's not accurate. The middle archer stand indicates a reliable and valid shot. That is reliable because the archer hits the bullseye, has three consistent shots, all hitting the bullseye. It's valid because it's hitting the bullseye, it is accurate. And lastly, the archer stand on the far right indicates an unreliable and hence not valid shooting range in that all three arrows are in, in different directions and they're not consistently in the bullseye. So this would be unvalid. Prime example of something being invalid but consistent is a scale. That every day some people stand on their scale and take their body mass. Well, scales, if you stand on your scale at the doctor's office versus the one at your parents' house versus your own, you might get completely different numbers. So that means it's inaccurate to your actual weight. But what you'll always get is a number in that a scale is always consistent. You'll always get a number. It just might not be accurate. So in this case, a scale is consistent, it's reliable, it provides a value, provides a body mass, but it might not be valid, it might not be accurate to what your actual body mass is. To ensure a test is valid and reliable, we need to ensure that you have a good tester quality. This means that anyone who's conducting a test must be well trained with thorough understanding of test procedures and protocols that you really want to have consistency between testers, which as we mentioned on the previous slides, is a major source of inter-rater variability. For example, some testers may provide verbal encouragement, some may administer the test differently, for in our example in the chin-ups using legs. Also, some testers may have different rest intervals between multiple trials. You must make sure that when you're doing a battery of testing, that you ensure that the testers are trained specific to the test and this will ensure that you minimize the measurement of error. 
as well, written test procedures and check checklists are very important to ensure that each tester knows exactly what they need to do. So now let's look at what we've covered so far. We've covered test terminology and evaluation of test quality, and now we're looking at the factors of test selection. So what should be considered when selecting an assessment test? One, we talked about validity and reliability of a test and of the tester. Second of all, we want to look at sport-specific tests based on the physical demands of the sport. So from an energy system standpoint, is the test specific to the demands of the sport in assessing energy systems? Is the test specific in assessing the biomechanical movement patterns of the sport? As well, we want to consider the athlete experience, the training status of the athlete, their age will dictate which tests you pick, environmental factors, as well as if the test needs a familiarization period in that is there a learning bias or a learning curve to the test? Is the test hard to learn? And at first it may not be accurate. So we're going to explore these factors now. One factor we need to consider when we're selecting a test is the energy systems of that sport. So does the test accurately measure the energy system of the sport? Whether it be an endurance based sport versus a speed or power based sport. Second of all, is the test that you're picking reliable from day to day? And there are ways to promote reliability, which is to use the same test as previously used, so you can see improvement or decrements in performance, using the same protocol, the same tester, and the same conditions. And then we want to consider the specificity of the test. We want to test must simulate the physical movements and energy demands of a game or of that sport for an endurance based sport is that you assess VO2 max as well as lactate profiling using a graded exercise test or indirectly using a field based, field based test like the Leger beep test. In contrast for a speed based sport you may want to assess acceleration, speed, 40 meter sprints that are more specific to the demands of that sport. Another consideration when selecting a test is the movement patterns of the sport or activity the person engages in. So the test movement patterns need to be specific to the demands of the game or the sport for valid assessment of the ability being tested. And you also want to consider positional differences. Some examples would be assessing vertical jump for basketball and v-ball versus hockey. Hockey, you wouldn't necessarily do a vertical jump. You may do more of a standing long jump because they're always moving forward or backwards. While in basketball and volleyball, they're moving vertically. So vertical jump height is important and that's what you would assess. As well, you want to consider positional differences for a football defensive linebacker versus a wide receiver. You may assess them differently. One, you're going to be doing more speed-based assessments, while for a lineman, you're going to be doing more power-based assessments, quick movements off the line, acceleration speed, power assessments. And then, for example, we have a picture here of a swimmer. You want to try to be as specific to the demands of that sport, and if you can get away with doing in-pool testing, that's the most accurate versus a lab-based test. Another factor to consider when selecting a test is experience and training status or age. So for a well-trained experienced athlete, a technique intensive test may be appropriate as it can be sport specific with the assumption that poor technique will not impair performance of the test while it could impair a novice based athlete. So an example of this is counting the number of one-legged hops to travel 25 meters can be a valid and reliable test of plyometric strength in an experienced athlete, but it's not for a novice because their technique will make the test an invalid indication of strength and explosive power. Instead, you may choose a test that's less technique intensive for a novice so that you can really assess plyometric strength and power this would be a more valid indication of their ability level. Age is also an important factor to consider when you're selecting a test. You would pick a different test for a child versus an advanced athlete versus a master's athlete. Another very important factor that impacts the selection of the test is the environment. For example, the time of day must be consistent that if you, there are changes in um, 
physiology based on circadian rhythms. So you want to ensure that if testing occurs at 9 a.m., that you replicate that, that it starts at 9 a.m. the next time you test. So you want to be consistent with the time of day, as well as trying to be consistent as much with the environmental conditions, such as temperature. As we know, high temperature and high humidity impairs endurance performance, which will lower the validity of the test in measuring that physical ability. So you want to be sure that you're consistent if you're um, doing testing in 20 degrees Celsius in a lab-based testing environment, then you want to replicate that by doing testing in 20 degrees Celsius lab-based dry environment. Okay, so you want to be as consistent as possible with environmental conditions. As well, pollution impacts how the respiratory system functions, which would make the test invalid. And then altitude, as we can see here, declines of 5% in max oxygen uptake of every 3,000 feet of elevation. So ultimately, what you would like is 10 days of acclimation before you engage in aerobic endurance testing to provide a valid indication of aerobic capacity for these athletes. Ultimately, the environment can significantly affect the validity of the test in assessing what it's supposed to assess. So it will, for example, if you're doing a test at altitude, it will underestimate the individual's VO2 max because you're breathing at a lower density of oxygen. So that's going to impact the results of a test so it won't be valid. It won't be a true indication of the person's ability level. The last factor of test selection that you need to be aware of is whether the test has a learning bias or a learning curve. Is the test hard to learn? And if so, the first time an athlete does the test, it may not be accurate to assess the physical abilities of that athlete. You may have to provide a familiarization period where the athlete is exposed to that testing protocol a few times in order to provide a valid or an accurate measurement of the physical ability you're wanting to assess. So to summarize test selection so far, Athlete experience, training status, age, and environmental factors can affect test performance and the validity of the test, how accurate the test is, and assessing what it's supposed to assess. All these factors must be considered when you're selecting a test. Remember that tests must be specific to the demands of the sport and the abilities you would like to assess. As well, familiarization of the test is key to ensure valid and reliable results. And this could be as simple as incorporating a test-specific warm-up, which will allow the athlete to become familiar with a progressive exercise test.